our third and last speaker for this conference and today is uh, Stephen Schumacher uh, from Duke University. Uh, Stephen is a professor at the University of Oregon. And uh, I'm sorry, I said from Duke University. This is where he graduated. He's from uh, University of Oregon. And uh, he's also an Ira E. Gaston Fellow in Christian Studies. Uh, he is a specialist on the history of religion and the late ancient Near East. Professor Shoemaker is the author of, among his numerous were other numerous works of A Prophet Has Appeared, The Rise of Islam Through Christian and Jewish Eyes that came out with the University of California Press in 221, The Death of the Prophet, The End of Muhammad's Life and the Beginning of Islam, University of Pennsylvania Press 211, a study of the historical Muhammad that focuses on traditions about the end of his life, and most recently he has published with University of California Press, Creating the Quran, a historical critical study. Professor Schumacher will sp speak today about early Islamic imperialism and colonialism, some preliminary thoughts with reference to Palestine. Uri, I see the clock is ticking, and I know you're a tough taskmaster, so I better get down to brass tacks pretty fast here. Uh, thank you, Marn, for inviting me. Thank you to the Academy for hosting this event. Thank you to all of the other speakers uh, for a series of excellent talks and all of the wonderful things I've learned from you that I'll take home with you from this, uh, this experience of mobility and migration. Uh, what I'm about to talk to you about today is something that is, is still very experimental for me. Uh, I have no idea if I'm really going to pursue this much further. I kind of was hoping I was done with Islam. Uh, this is kind of a trial balloon for me, and I, I know you guys have a lot going on here, but if you follow the news in our country, experimental balloons are not faring very well over our skies these days. So hopefully this will do, last a little bit better than that. Um, it came about because I was invited about a year ago to participate in a team that wanted to study the uh, Muhammad, the Quran, and the beginnings of Islam as an anti-imperial enterprise. And that just seemed uh, uh, unthinkable to me. So I thought to try a couple pieces here and see where this goes. And you are some of the first guinea pigs to uh, get to hear the, what goes on in my mind when, I, when someone suggests that to me. So over a century ago, Karl Heinrich Becker published an article on the Arabs as colonizers, in which he noted that although the Arabs were the greatest and most successful colonizers of the Middle Ages, their intensive colonial activities had hardly been studied. The past century has seen little change in this regard, and it would seem that we still await a systematic investigation of early Islamic imperialism and colonialism comparable to the extensive analyses that have been undertaken, for instance, of Greek and Roman imperialism and colonization, not to mention the somewhat different phenomenon of modern imperialism and colonialism. Needless to say, although it might be slightly taboo to say out loud in the present moment, there can be little question that from its very beginnings, the religious polity that Muhammad founded was both an imperial and colonial enterprise. While the Quran names its new religious community the believers, a term that I will regularly employ, at least as early as the reign of Umar, Muhammad's followers also identified themselves as the muhajirun, the migrants, or even the settlers. Of course, this term possibly refers at some level to the tradition of Muhammad's hijra, his migration from Mecca to Yathrib, an event that his followers recalled as marking the beginnings of their new religious movement. Yet the traditional identification of the Muhajirun strictly with those who emigrated with Muhammad to Yathrib in 622 does not seem to occur until much later in the Abbasid era. Moreover, the early believers continued to identify themselves as migrants long after this initial migration took place, after they had conquered not only Mecca, but much of the known world. By the middle of the seventh century, the overwhelming majority of those belonging to the community of believers would undoubtedly have had no role in that early relocation from Mecca to Yathrib. Given the very meager population of Mecca at the time, as we will see in a moment, one imagines that there couldn't have been more than a few dozen people with their families involved. This prompts a second question, which may hold the answer to our first. Why then were Muhammad's followers continuing to identify themselves as the migrants 
seemingly without reference to Muhammad's own individual migration. Indeed, already in the Quran, the, no the notion of migration by the believers, their collective hijra, has become separated from any event in the life of Muhammad. Other scholars have rightly observed that continued use of the self-designation, the migrants, by Muhammad's early followers, obviously must point to some sort of significance for this term beyond the original hijra. Perhaps most famous and influential study of this use of muhajirun uh, in this context is Patricia Crona's 1994 article, The First Century Concept of Hijra. Krona and Fred Donner, after her, both observed that in the Quran, immigration is closely linked with the obligation to wage holy war in God's path, a connection that continues in later Arabic literature as well. Nevertheless, by the time of the Near Eastern conquests and colonization, the term had, become, had come to be widely used by the believers to denote both the early Muslims in general who migrated to the conquered areas and the nomads who had settled in these lands. Contemporary Christians writing in Greek and Syriac also used the term muhajirun, migrants, to designate these people who had conquered and settled among them. Clearly then, Muhammad's earliest followers understood themselves as a community of migrants and settlers who as a part of their religious faith had a sacred duty to migrate and colonize other lands. Admittedly, during the first decades of its expansion out from the Arabian Peninsula, the governing structures of this polity were necessarily a bit ad hoc and minimal. And yet the believers quickly took possession of a domain that was both imperial and increasingly colonial in nature. Just 10 years after Muhammad's death and within 20 years of the community's foundation, the believers had seized control of the heartlands of the Sasanian Empire and the richest and most populous territories of the Roman Empire even as they were continuing to expand both to the east and to the west at a breathtaking pace. It was such an impressive and ultimately consequential feat that many historians often forget to pause and consider the startling realities events, sorry, the starting, startling reality of these events in terms of movements of peoples, particularly in relation to the vast amounts of territory involved. From its beginnings, Muhammad's new religious movement must have been very small in numbers, much smaller, I think, than most people would immediately realize. Both Mecca and the Yathrib Oasis were, after all, by all indications, very small and isolated settlements in the arid deserts of Western Arabia that were not well integrated with the worlds of Mediterranean and Mesopotamian late antiquity. Of the two, Mecca would appear to be the smaller and more isolated. It has extremely limited natural water sources, amounting to only a few brackish wells and a small spring. And so it was, as Corona observes, I quote her, devoid of food and other amenities that human beings and other animals generally require to engage in activities of any kind, end quote. With such scarce natural resources available, it is hard to imagine that Mecca could sustain a very large population in Muhammad's lifetime. Indeed, a recently published study in, in Dar Islam has convincingly determined that the likely number of total inhabitants in Mecca during Muhammad's lifetime was around 500 or so, with only around 130 free adult men. Yathrib, the future Medina, where Muhammad and his followers would first come into power, stood, only, stood in only marginally better circumstances. Yathrib was an oasis that was surrounded, like Mecca, by a barren mountainous desert. Also like Mecca, Yathra was certainly not sizable enough to be considered a town, let alone a city. In fact, prior to the beginnings of Islam, Yathra was not even the name of a particular town, but rather the name given to the oasis itself, which encompassed altogether approximately 50 square kilometers. Within this region, there was no single organized or dominant settlement, but instead the oasis was composed of a group of loosely connected and disparate settlements. These hamlets and homesteads were scattered across the oasis's 50 square kilometer expanse and clustered around the valley's main water sources, where their inhabitants relied on this precious resource to engage in limited agriculture. Thanks to its better water supply, the oasis of Yathrib could presumably support a slightly larger population than Mecca, probably somewhere around 1,000 inhabitants in total. Yet we should not mistake Yathrib for a small village of this size. 
There were more than a dozen small individual settlements within the oasis of Yathrib, and its inhabitants were dispersed and divided among these. Undoubtedly, no single one of these hamlets was even as big as Mecca, and presumably no single settlement in Yathrib had a population of more than a couple hundred people, while most of them probably had less than 100 inhabitants. And of these inhabitants, one should note, likely only around one-third would have been free adult males. Accordingly, we must conclude that at Muhammad's death, his community was still very small in numbers, particularly if we follow the Islamic tradition's memory of his death. Beginning with only several hundred Meccans and Medinans, the community presumably had grown in numbers as the polity expanded its influence over roughly the western half of the Arabian Peninsula by the early 630s. One imagines that at this point it had grown to perhaps maybe 10,000, I don't know. By the time Abu Bakr had completed the conquest of the entire peninsula, how many people would have been part of this new polity? Maybe 20,000? In any case, we're still dealing with a relatively small community, particularly in light of what would soon follow. According to the best estimate that I can find, uh, and this is from Donner, there were somewhere between just 30 and 50,000 men among the believers as they set forth into Roman Palestine. Given the arid climate of the, most of the peninsula, I must say that I would be inclined towards the lower end of that range. In any case, Donner concludes that based on these smaller numbers, we should not envision, I quote him, a mass migration of Arabian tribesmen, in quote, in the early years of the believer's conquest of the Near East. We need not rehearse here the historian's bewilderment that such a small and poorly equipped force could somehow have so quickly defeated the Romans and assumed control of much of Western Arabia and North Africa. For our purposes, it is perplexing enough to consider how Muhammad's followers were able to establish and maintain sovereignty over such a vast and populous expanse, even as they continued to expand the boundaries of their polity with almost incredible alacrity. In these early decades, we are dealing with a company of some 40,000 fighting men, most of whom were likely illiterate and uneducated. Suddenly faced with the task of administering a realm encompassing millions of square miles, square kilometers, excuse me, um, a territory only a little smaller than the contiguous United States of America. In the midst of all of this, they continued to expand both eastward and westward with great speed, stretching their numbers ever thinner in the process. Obviously, one way that the believers managed their nascent empire was to employ existing experts and elites in their service to manage affairs on their behalf. Such employ of non-Muslims seems to have been very common during the empire's early history and would continue at least through the end of the seventh century. Perhaps during this time, some new converts also joined the believers' cause, helping them to relieve combat attrition and perhaps filling in for some who would have stayed behind to run things in the newly occupied territories. Of course, it is difficult even to guesstimate the number of such conversions in a meaningful way, given the state of our sources and the chaotic conditions of the conquest. The problem is only further complicated by the seemingly interconfessional nature of the community of the believers in its earliest decades, since it appears to have welcomed Christians and Jews to join this new religious movement, even as they remained in their, religious, their original religious faith. Suffice it to say, however, by all indications, the rate of conversion during the seventh century seems to have remained quite low. This would hardly be surprising, inasmuch as most of the indigenous population during this period considered the reign of Muhammad's followers a temporary phenomenon. The fact that even as late as the Crusades, as we just heard before, Muslims were not a majority in the Middle East stands as clear evidence that conversion to Islam was a very slow process from the start. In the beginning, the believers established their hegemony, as is well known, by creating new settlements to serve as military garrisons. The most important of these early martial colonies were established in Iraq in order to maintain control of this newly conquered heartland of the Sasanian Empire, as the believers' armies continued their march across Asia, Asia and Africa. It was a practice that to a certain extent mimicked the Roman practice of establishing colonia in newly occupied territories and border regions. The first three of these garrison towns were, of course, Basra and Kufa in southern Mesopotamia, and in the north, Mosul, which was established soon thereafter by the Kufans. 
Likewise, after the conquest of Egypt, another garrison town with the name Pustat was established to maintain control of Egypt. Maintain control of Egypt. Sorry. Once some of the army's dependents began to settle into these cities, we can estimate a population of around 20,000 for Kufa, only about 1,000 for Basra at the start of Uthman's reign, while Mosul appears to have had a few thousand Arab settler soldiers around the same time. And again, I'm relying mostly on Donner and Chase Robinson here for these numbers. By the following decades, these three, as these three Iraqi settlements had grown quickly to around 350,000 combined by 670, about one-third of which were soldiers, with the rest being their dependents. Although the number of Muhammad's followers in the conquered lands had grown considerably by this, considerably by this point, they nevertheless remain a vastly outnumbered minority within the territories that they ruled. Our best estimate for the population of the Believer's Empire at this time is somewhere around 20 million, meaning that the Believers were significantly outnumbered by their colonial subjects. Of course, more recent empires have similarly maintained their colonial power with such small military settlements. As Becker, who I mentioned at the beginning, notes, for instance, when he was writing, the English authority over 13 million Egyptians was maintained by just a few thousand English troops. In similar fashion, then, as Krona observes in her post-colonial analysis of Islam in 10th century Iran, during these early decades, the believers established their dominion as, and I quote her, a colonial empire of the classic type, with a separate metropole, Arabia, and periphery, Syria, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, unquote. Indeed, the obvious similarity of these imperial structures, modern and medieval, is, as Krona further remarks, I quote her, so old that I do not know who first came up with it, end quote. The believer's settlement into Syria, Palestine, however, followed a different pattern in that Muhammad's followers preferred to take up residence in the already existing cities of these lands. There they lived as a small minority along the many Jews and Christians of this region. Why Muhammad's followers settled Syria, Palestine in this different way during the 7th century is admittedly not entirely clear, at least to me. I would suspect, however, that it reflects the very different value that Jerusalem, the Holy Lands, even greater Syria, held in the believer's sacred geography. By all indications, the Christian and Jewish Holy Land was also the original Islamic Holy Land, an Abrahamic patrimony that rightfully belonged to the children of Abraham, and not only to the Jews in the believer's worldview, but to all of Abraham's progeny, including themselves and the Christians as well. The believers had longed to possess these lands from their ver the very foundation of their community, viewing them not only as their rightful inheritance by divine promise, but they also looked to their impending liberation from the wicked Romans as an apocalyptic event that would inaugurate the eschaton's arrival. The final judgment in God's eternal reign would soon follow once Jerusalem and Palestine had been liberated and restored the children to the children of Abraham. And indeed, it turns out that the self-designation, the migrants, is particularly prominent in the early Islamic apocalyptic tradition, where it regularly refers to those believers who were to fight for God in the battles of the end times. Thus, this migratory colonizing identity appears to have been directly joined with the eschatological expectations of the early community of believers, which would have strongly encouraged their rush towards Jerusalem and Palestine. The awaited eschaton, of course, did not come as expected. And as time passed, these migrants gradually began to settle into the lands that they had conquered for the long haul. Yet even as their apocalyptic hopes continued to remain in abeyance, migration to and colonization of the newly occupied lands remained a religious obligation for the believers. In the case of Syria and Palestine, the presence of large Jewish and Christian communities in these territories may have further encouraged the believers to settle in among them, inasmuch as they appear to have regarded the righteous members of these faiths as their spiritual allies, if not in some instances even as co-religionists. Such confessional kinship may have prompted a desire to settle in among these Abrahamic cousins. Likewise, Jerusalem, Palestine, and even Syria were dense with sites of great religious significance and reverence for both Jews and Christians, as well as, presumably, uh, very many among the early believers. 
No doubt the believers wanted to possess these holy places and dwell among them, while the lands of Iraq and Egypt did not have nearly the same sacred charge, and so their populations and resources could, be most, could most effectively be man managed through colonial military outposts. Indeed, a number of early sources reveal the believers' desire to venerate and even possess many of the most important Jewish and Christian holy places, often directly through colonial appropriation of sacred space. The most obvious and notorious such example is, of course, the believers' construction of a new sacred monument on the site of the destroyed Jerusalem temple, an endeavor that would ultimately culminate in the erection of the Dome of the Rock. A number of contemporary witnesses, both Jewish and Christian, attest that almost immediately after seizing control of Jerusalem, the believers set about building a place for worship where the demolished temple once stood. According to a 7th century Greek chronicle, now lost but known through its use by several later chroniclers, Sophronius, after surrendering Jerusalem to the army of the believers, welcomed Umar into the city and provided him with clean clothes so that he could visit the Temple Mount where he planned to build a place of worship. One of our very best sources for this period, the anonymous Armenian chronicle attributed to Sebaos, reports that the believers initially encouraged the Jews to undertake this renovation project, only to seize the structure for themselves after its completion. This original house of prayer was likely not the Dome of the Rock, however. Thus, it would appear that the Dome of the Rock was not the first monument built on the site of the temple, but was instead the culmination of the believers' efforts to restore worship and dignity to the abomination of desolation that remained of God's holy house. The vanished Jerusalem temple was clearly of enormous religious significance for Muhammad's earliest followers, and its locus seems to have stood at the center of their sacred geography. The temple had been the original focus of their prayers, and restoration of its sanctity, even in its temporal absence, was a high priority in advance of the coming divine restoration of the temple itself, which seemingly was soon expected to occur in the events of the appending eschaton. The believer's appropriation and renewal of the temple's sacred precincts was therefore a high religious priority upon taking Jerusalem. Of course, as others have observed, building a grand Islamic monument on the Temple Mount obviously sent a political as well as a religious message. Their shrine on the site of the temple would have been visible throughout the city as a reminder of just who was now in charge. Likewise, any rebuilding at the site of the temple was sure to alarm many of the region's Christians, at least those who were not aligned with the believers, since the Christians of late antiquity regularly pointed to the destroyed temple as a visible testimony to the truth of their faith. Yet these motives notwithstanding, one imagines that the believer's interest in building on the site of the temple was not simply intended to be provocative, but was motivated by genuine religious conviction and reverence for the sanctity of this place. One might also note, however, that it was perhaps convenient for the believers that the fir their first colonial appropriation of a significant holy place in Jerusalem was an abandoned site. In this way, they could dramatically impress their religious and political dominion on the city's landscape without having to seize an existing shrine and run the risk of aggravating the religious community that had been displaced. The believers did not, likely because they could not, erase the existing holy sites of Jerusalem and Palestine to replace them with new Islamic Holy, a new Islamic holy land laid, echoing Jonathan D. Smith here, palimpsest-like over the old as the Christians had done in the case of their construction of a holy land. Only after centuries would they successfully create an Islamic topography for the holy city, although this could only ever rival rather than replace the older sacred landscapes of Judaism and Christianity. A similar dynamic comes to mind in regard to an important Christian shrine that seems to have been appropriated by the believers at a relatively early stage in their occupation of Jerusalem, namely the Kathisma Church. This ancient Christian sanctuary had stood at the midpoint of the Jerusalem-Bethlehem Road since at least the middle of the fifth century. Although by this time, sorry, although by that time this church had become a shrine to the Virgin Mary, the origins of its sanctity lie in an early Christian memory locating the birth of Jesus in this location rather than in Bethlehem, a tradition that seems to have been 
this, the Jerusalem area's oldest nativity tradition. Yet once the nativity tradition of the canonical gospels came to prevail instead, this site's original significance as the site of Jesus' birth had to be rethought, and new significance for its sanctity had to be found. Accordingly, as we can see from the liturgical and pilgrimage traditions associated with the Catholic Church in late antiquity, it became a shrine commemorating Mary's role in the divine nativity, thus maintaining some connection to its original significance. Perhaps most importantly for the present context, however, two important early Christian traditions regarding the birth of Jesus were uniquely joined at the Catholic Church. The ancient tradition of Jesus' birth in a remote, ex-urban location, and the miraculous feeding of his mother from a spring in a palm tree. Alert listeners will recognize that these are indeed the two traditions that underlie the Quran's account of Jesus' nativity, a point of considerable significance, given that the Catholic Church is the only place in early Christian tradition where these two memories about the birth of Jesus came together. Surely it is no coincidence that this was the second major locus sanctus in the holy city to be appropriated by its new colonizers and that its traditions found their way into the believer's new scripture. Oh my. <laughs> um, where was I? Sometime around the beginning of the 8th century, this church was turned into a mosque. And judging from the mosaic decorations dating to this period, a palm tree laden with dates, its connections with the nativity remained, even in its new Islamic guise. Presumably, the Muslim rulers converted it into a nativity shrine of their own to match the nativity traditions of their nascent scripture. No doubt, the great reverence for Mary within this new religious movement, as attested by the Quran itself, made such an appropriation all the more attractive. This was, so it would seem, the first sacred site commandeered by the new rulers for conversion into a sacred shrine belonging to their own tradition, although I may be flat out wrong on that. One imagines that the complex and confused significance of this holy place, owing in large part to its displacement by the canonical shrine of the nativity in Bethlehem, made it easier for Muslim authorities to seize and convert this church than would have been the case for so many other important Christian shrines in the Jerusalem area. Its original feast day had long been displaced from the Kathisma to the Virgin's tomb in Gethsemane, and the effort to assign it with new significance resulted in an unprecedented and peculiar fusion of otherwise unrelated apocryphal traditions about the nativity, again, just as we find in the Quran. It was, in effect, a sort of awkward, vestigial sacred site whose confiscation and conversion by the reigning authorities would not be nearly so provocative as an attempt to do so with the anastasis, the basilica of the nativity, the tomb of the virgin, or some other major Christian shrine. By comparison, the stakes in this first colonial confiscation of a Christian shrine would have been significantly lower. One finds very similar attitudes towards such major religious shrines on display, for instance, in an early account of Muawiyah's coronation from the 7th century Syriac Maronite Chronicle. Based on internal evidence, we can determine that this chronicle was composed very shortly after the events in question, sometime toward the end of the 660s CE, making it a near contemporary witness of particularly high quality. According to the Maronite Chronicle, after his coronation in Jerusalem in 661, Muawiyah, and I quote, went up and sat at Golgotha and prayed there. And he went to Gethsemane and went down to the tomb of the Blessed Mary and prayed there, end quote. Several things are of note here. First, Muawiyah's decision to be coronated in Jerusalem was surely quite deliberate. As the new commander of the believers, it made sense for the leader of what clearly still remained in many ways at this time, an interconfessional movement, to be crowned as king in the city of David's rule and of Christ the king. Likewise, his decision to immediately pray at two of Jerusalem's oldest and most important uh, got my pages mixed up there. Christian shrines, the churches of Golgotha, the Anastasis, the Tomb of the Virgin, shows evidence of his and presumably the community of the believers, devotion to Jesus and Mary in the context of their Christian veneration. It is a clear sign, one among many, of the community's continued interconfessional nature at this point. Muawiyah's first act as the, commander, as the community's leader was not to pray in a mosque or on the Temple Mount, 
but in the two holiest Christian shrines dedicated to the two most important figures of the Christian tradition. Mu'awiyah's actions on this occasion offer a remarkable example of the sort of cultural hybridity that regularly takes place in an imperial and colonial context, a point to which I would turn at some length in the remainder of this paper, but obviously I cannot here for the constraints of time. But at this point, in what is admittedly some very tentative and preliminary work, we may conclude with two brief observations. On the one hand, Mu'awiyah's veneration of these shrines supports our hypothesis that the believers settled in amongst the populace of Syro-Palestine, and Palestine in particular, rather than establishing military colonies there in order to be close to and venerate the holy places of the holy lands. On the other hand, we see here also that the believers did not simply co-opt these major Christian shrines for their new religious community, as they did with the ruined Temple Mount, or eventually with the Kathisma Church. Presumably, as, as suggested above, it would have been difficult for them to seize these holy places from the majority Christian population. At the same time, however, Moawiyah's reverence for these sites in the context of his coronation suggests that the believers simply had no desire to appropriate and transform these Christian shrines. Instead, they already held in their current state as Christian holy places religious significance for members of the community of the believers who revered them as they were as part of their own religious faith and practice. I thank you very much. <laughs> I, might have, I might have angered a deity. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, we have time for questions for this uh, provocative talk. Please. I wonder if you could say a bit more about the difference between interconfessional inter and non-confessional. That's to say how much you think the populace are going to be involved in this, or how much this is an elite versus a non-elite question, where things flare into significance. Because it's a, the picture you're giving us is, a, is an interesting one. And I'd just like a little more nuance on those particular tensions. Yeah. Um, well, it's, I would call it interconfessional rather than non-confessional because there are confessions. There are, there are faiths involved here, people believing, confessing things. What's, what's in the background here that uh, perhaps you're not aware of, uh, which is supposedly my fault, for, but it, I only have a certain amount of time, is I subscribe to a, a, a hypothesis articulated by Fred Donner uh, of the nature of the earliest movement founded by Muhammad as an interconfessional movement. He calls it ecumenical, which I think is a, a deeply problematic word, uh, given the, the, the meaning that holds in Christian, contemporary Christian interfaith dialogue. Mm -hmm. Uh, I go with interconfessional, which admittedly is not perfect, but what we're looking at here is a movement of Abrahamic monotheists who seem to have come together under Muhammad's leadership, uh, political leadership, but I think even to a certain extent prophetic leadership, not prophetic in the sense of giving a new dispensation, but prophetic as having been called by God to raise up this movement in this time, and the core tenets of the movement are faith in God and belief in the end day, right? That the end of the world is about to come. Uh, and this, this is, you know, uh, a very simple confession that all of these people could share. And it seems a lot of the larger differences, according to the hypothesis, were able to be overlooked uh, for some time in the early movement before it eventually became a new religious faith, a sectarian community that we would later on identify as Islam with confession of its own new scripture, its own unique final prophet, et cetera, et cetera, things like that. So in terms of class, uh, I, think it's, I think it's overwhelmingly in the beginnings uh, uh, an underclass movement. Uh, the Mecca and Medina, according to the latest scholarship on the history of the Arab la Arabic language, were, were illiterate. Right, there was they were unliterate civilizations. They had writing in their presence, but they weren't using it for government or for culture. So, I mean, these are not going to be. And I would imagine all kinds of people joined in as it grew. Uh, Thank you very much, Stephen. I was while you were talking. I was remembered of how once a friend of mine who is 
distinguished Arabist and Islamists is described the early Arab armies, oh. Arab or Muslim armies. It's a, the, the early Muslims said, Mormons with an army. You know, but uh, but what I want to reflect on is to go back to your uh, term colonialism and imperialism. Mm -hmm. uh, for imperialism to be uh, adequately used, you need an empire yeah. first, and expanding uh, uh, expansion of an empire, which is really not the case in seventh century. Uh, West Arabia. The second is that uh, the Muslim Fath movement of expansion, I think, uh, the, the one obvious thing that they want to do, not to everybody, but to as many people as possible in the conquered lands, is to have them accept their religion, which, is, which makes the movement strikingly different from most colonialist movements. Not all, but most colonialist movements we know. So mm. this is a caveat. I, I yeah, think yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting to speak about imperialism and, and colonialism. It's provocative. It, it, uh, it's, it may even be dangerous in American universities, yeah. I don't know. It but, is. But, but it's, it's not quite adequate, I think. Well, like I say, this, this, uh, this is an experiment. I have no idea where I'll go with it. Um, part, of, part of thinking it through, though, is how some of these terms like, the, you know, I don't know which is worse, my Arabic or my grasp of modern cultural theory. It's like a race to the bottom, honestly. But it seems to me that some of these categories that people have deployed in, in colonial and post-colonial analysis might be very helpful for under, understanding the kind of fusion and the formation of identities that are going on here. Uh, for instance, one of the most, as I've been told by people who know a lot more about this stuff than I do, one of the, the key aspects is this notion of hybridity is that it, it, it forms primarily the colonizer's identity in the process. And indeed, that's one of the things that seems to be going on. Uh, certainly, if you subscribe like I do, say, to, to Peter Webb's work, that really Arab as an ethnos, as an identity, Islam as a religion, is only really being formed at the, by the time we get to Abdul Malik. And it's being formed in a colonial crucible. And it's being formed in terms of sort of hybrid identities formed in relation to these people who are now there they're subjects, right? If not uh, the colonized, uh, you know. I mean, there's there's a whole there's a whole criticism of applying any of this post-colonial stuff to anything outside of a modern context, and it's a legitimate one. I mean, beyond the, the very legitimate points you raise. So on the whole, it's 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 not just controversial within the academy. It's controversial in terms of the methodologies that are being used. Uh, but I mean, one thing I do later in the paper is I look at the different kind of colonial models that we've seen in the ancient world and what does the Islamic one look like? Does it look more like a Greek one? Does it look more like a Roman one? Does it look more like a Persian one? You know, and so this kind of stuff maybe is helpful, even if it's not perfect. I don't know, but we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. As for your Mormons with an army, ah, oh, yeah. Well, the Mormons, Mormons did shoot a few people here and there, but... Uh, uh, it's interesting, one of the things I noticed in the book on the Quran I published was there's a whole history of comparing the Book of Mormon to the Quran when the Book of Mormon first appears. Uh, and it's done so derisively for the Book of Mormon, right? This is proof that the Book of Mormon is not something serious, just like the Quran is not something serious. Now, that's not quoting me, right? Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and they're very similar actually when you think you, basically in both books what you're taking is in the Quran, you're taking all of the biblical tradition and you're rewriting it onto an American landscape. And what do you do in the Quran, right? And in Islam, ultimately, you take the biblical tradition and you rewrite it into Arabic and onto an Arabian landscape. They're really striking the similar. There's a little bit of that in the book I'll send you. What? And the migration, of course, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, in the case of the Mormons, they were constantly being kicked westward, but in any case. Thank you. Um, very interesting. And uh, I wonder, how did it work in Jerusalem? Uh, what is your idea or your guess about life in Jerusalem or in the 
the conquerors, the Muslims, they didn't er erase former tradition, I mean the Christian uh, holy places, but joined them. Uh, on the other hand, we have these uh, orders by Islamic uh, uh, scholars in the 8th century, I think, I, uh, El Ad cites them, don't go to the tomb of Mary, don't go to the, to the church of the Ascension because uh, those who go there won't, are, uh, are, working, are idolaters. And they did go because otherwise we didn't need uh, all these orders against it. So I wonder how it, how it worked. Did they pray together? Did they come one, one after the other? Did they join the liturgy? Things like that, I mean, in the Catisma as well. The, uh, it's a fascinating question. And of course, I think we all wish that I or someone else could give us a good answer on it. Uh, starting with the beginning, uh, you know, I think, I think those are actually very nice bookends, right, that you have here in an early phase, you have evidence that people are doing this. You have later on at a stage when Islam has very carefully separated its identity from these other people saying, don't mix with those people, right? Uh, I think one sees a similar kind of thing going on vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Judaism and Christianity is, you know, you see a real concern. Don't celebrate the Passover. Make sure Passover doesn't ever coincide with Easter. Put it a week later, right? Because originally these things were blurry. And then you're taking, taking steps as you're defining yourself to, to create these boundaries. The, I don't know how it would have worked, you know. Um, I mean, if obviously Moawiyah could probably go down to these churches whenever he wanted after. They would clear the way. It would be like when I see in the streets the other day, you know, the guys in the Fez is walking with the patriarch behind them. People got out of the way, and he went straight to the church. Um, with regular Muslims, I, I just don't know. Um, one imagines they wouldn't have been participating in Eucharistic ceremonies on the one hand, but on the other hand, you look at... Uh, the evidence that, say, Michael Penn and Jack Tannus have collected of all these weird stories of Muslims who revere the Christian Eucharist and, and find it some kind of, you know, it's almost like a magical thing for them rather than the body and blood of Christ. So maybe they're going. But uh, Now, as for the Catholicism, I, well, the, the, the paper that I presented at the conference we were in Regensburg, I don't think, as the, the Israeli team has concluded, that it's being used as a shared space in the seventh, in the eighth century. Once the apse is destroyed, it's not a church. Once you don't have an altar, you don't have a church, right? It's something else. And uh, the, the, uh, the inscription in this case, I think, is very vague. It can be read very differently. The Greek team read it very differently from the Israeli team. The original epigrapher on site dated it to the sixth century rather than the eighth century. I think given all of the other evidence, if it can be sixth or eighth century, it's gotta be sixth century. It makes so much more sense in that place. And unless the dating of the destruction of the apse is wrong. If the dating of the destruction of the apse is correct and it's before the eighth century, then I don't see how you can have, you have Christians worshiping there. I mean, maybe they can just go and visit it as a holy place, but there's not going to be a monastery there, which is what's concluded from the inscription. So. Thank you. Well, yeah, last question. My question is more on a theoretical level, the problem of concept building. I find, found your... You talk very fascinating. On the other hand, I'm very skeptical for reasons he also named. I wonder whether it might be helpful to look at your concept of colonialism through Wittgensteinian eyes in the sense that he has the idea of bundle concepts. So certain concepts such as colonialism in the post-colonial de debate contain several elements that can be distinguished. For example, hybridity, some of them are very useful mm -hmm. and might be transferred to earlier epochs, others do not work as well. In that sense, yes. it might be helpful to, found, to find elements for a great comparison between different historical epochs. I mean, I, I definitely have found this, that some of, this, some of these tools work better than others, and that's just gonna be the case in most instances. Uh, but I mean, as for you know, the, the language of imperialism and colonialism, maybe I do need to d define these a little more clearly for myself, but when you have people coming and, and settling in military colonies, what is that? Is that not colonialism? I, I don't know what else to call it. It's when you one have, element which could be called colonialism. Yeah. And when you have this vast territory that 
this polity is ruling over even, I, I, I mean, one of the criticisms of calling it an empire is I don't know what kind, of a, what kind of a government do they really have at this point, right? I mean, I don't think they have much of a state until you get to Abdul Malik. It's arguable by the time you're with Muawiyah, um, but I think really something that we could call an imperial administration is only being set up with Abdul Malik, right? So if you're thinking in terms of an empire as something that has an administration, yeah, this is not it here in the 650s. But if you're thinking of an empire as a vast international multicultural territory that's ruled over by a single polity, maybe that's the definition I just needed to find right there, I don't know, um, then I think this is an empire. But thank you. I mean, these kinds of questions are extremely helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you all.